Ok. What I want to do sort of, uh, about just over half an hour, folks, is to take you through what I, a presentation I was giving at the SAS Global Forum uh, 2019 yesterday, uh, on Tuesday in Dallas, in Texas. With SAS. This is the biggest annual conference SAS do around the world, and they get people from all over the world coming to visit it. Whereas you, they also do regional and country conferences as well, and there's one in a few weeks in, the, in Birmingham. But what I was looking at was partly I was publishing the work of well, some of my um, final year students looking at accuracy of GPS. And a lot of the work we've done so far has been with photo, uh, location tag photos at known locations. So it's dead easy to calculate the accuracy with, with those photos. But what we've moved on to doing is looking at the GPS traces for journeys. And on a journey, you have no knowledge of the precise position of any of the readings. You've just got the readings themselves. Except you might know the, the start point and you might know the end point, but unless you've got additional technology, additional data capture, then you don't actually know where any of those points are uh, in relation to geography, unless you plot it onto a map, and then you can begin to see that actually uh, most of the readings are not on the road that you're on. They are on the beside the road, or they're on the wrong lane, the wrong side, the dual carriageway, and so on. And so what we were looking for last year, and doing some more work this year, is can we look at the internal consistency of the data? Can we look at aspects of the data that can tell us <coughs> where so, for certain that some of the points are definitely wrong? We may not be able to estimate their accu the accuracy, but perhaps there are ways we can do. And so two students last year uh, discovered uh, in the SAS ETS uh, econ econometric time series, there's a pro procedure called Procarima, which could be useful, they thought. Now, one of the reasons for using for, for that this investigation was because Arima in SAS ETS is designed for econometric time series where you typically have relatively few points, you know, maybe 12 monthly points or maybe five years of of points, which is 60 points. But for journeys, taking readings every five seconds, every second, then you are looking at hun many hundreds, if not thousands, of data points. The question was, at what point, in a sense, was, at what point does SAS Procarima kind of give up? Because it got too much data in it. So I want to start off just looking at some of the basic aspects of consumer level GPS whether with smart devices where you've got assisted GPS, which means that you've got a quick startup because you can go to the cell um, location server and pick up the update data about where the satellites are, satellites are, the ephemeris data, which is otherwise transmitted to pure GPS over the signal over a period of about six to 12 minutes. And so you get this much quicker startup. I want to look at how we do the anomaly detection because one of the things that was interesting with the first round three years ago, or three projects worth ago, was that the students looked at the data, latitude, longitude, timestamp, altitude, as a series of data points, just as data, numbers, without any context. And it became quite apparent that, that they were struggling to find any ways of sorting out what was going on. It turned out, ultimately, when we started, well, I started pointing the students to the fact that these, this isn't just pure data without context, just sets of numbers. It's actually data in context. The context being is people moving on buses, on bicycles, on trains, and on feet. Um, and as a result, that context gives you some physics, some mechanics, which helps you to understand what's feasible and what's not feasible when you look at things like check the rapid changes in velocity or direction that you can actually get when you look at the, these traces. 
And it's kind of interesting because it was surprising that they hadn't realized that there is physics involved in travel. We can't accelerate at 20, 30, 40 meters per second squared for 3 or 4 G. Humans don't do that. Cars don't do that except Formula One, which can accelerate at, I know, 2, 3 G. You can decelerate brake at about 5 G. They can go around corners with 5 G uh, lateral acceleration. Um, but not meant, nothing, no other normal transport can do that. So we have different ways of capturing data for, at consumer level. We either look at a sat-nav, which may be pure GPS, or there may be GPS plus um, a, a three-axis accelerometer, which gives you some interesting data, which allows your sat-nav to track you as you go through the tunnels up in the centre of Birmingham. Whereas if it's a pure GPS one, it gives up and gets stuck, hasn't a clue where you are for a bit until it gets the signals again. You have the smartphones, which have this assisted GPS side, a quick startup. And then you have a nice little gadgets like this, which is what I've been using this last year or two to collect a lot of journey data at one second intervals. I've also done work where I've stuck it outside <coughs> in the garden in a plastic box uh, to take a reading every second for perhaps three, four days on the trot, change the battery every six, seven hours and um, collecting tens, hundreds of thousands of data points to see what we can see. Now, one of the things that is interesting about using GPS, it's the one that's probably the most error prone of all of the IoT devices. It's very, very variable, just because of the physics of the atmosphere uh, and the stuff around you. But, as John Eason from IBM in 2012 pointed out, something like 80% of all the data we have around us is of uncertain veracity. Not that it's all wrong, but just that we don't actually know which data points are correct and which data points are incorrect. Now, when I first saw this at the SAS conference down at Marlow, I thought, oh, enterprise data, yeah, that's the 20%, that's the stuff we can trust. But then, a little while after that, I had a student here who was a mature student, part-time student from Rolls-Royce, who was on a work party project that it was, had been running for a year and a half when she came here to go inside all of the ERP data in SAP. Now, Rolls-Royce uh, Aerospace implemented SAP in east of 2000. And before they went live and transferred the data out of the 400 old legacy systems, they did a huge data cleansing exercise and threw away 70% or so of all of the master data that was in those systems. It's all out of date, it's correct. And went live with completely, or completely clean as we could make it. Within about six to seven years, that, was contaminated to a level that they weren't sure what the system was doing. And this is endemic across every company that goes with ERP systems or big systems like this. They have to continually cleanse the data. If you look at experience of people of companies using SAS or SAS and other big analytics packages, they have to do an enormous amount of data cleansing all the time. Before you go live with an AI or an ML machine learning system, you have to spend around about 80% of your total project time and cost just cleaning up the data, labeling it and doing stuff like that before you can use it. And then, once you have gone live with your AI or your ML system, you have to continually massage and clean up the data before you put it into your uh, machine learning system to actually carry on doing your decision making for you. I mean, as a, an example, there's a company in the UK that produces an AI-based um, intrusion detection system. It monitors the internal flows of information packets between databases and systems and who's logged in and so on. And it tries to catch 
the sort of uh, well, both in intrusions from outside, but also illegal activity inside, right, from the insiders. But they say, they make a point that you have to train up the AI that runs the system. You need one full year's worth of data of your internal network traffic that has to be clean before you can train their system. So you can just imagine when you've got millions of activities a day, tens to hundreds of millions of activities in the system, how do you identify, well you use your current IDS and that'll tell you the stuff that it knows about, but it'll otherwise assume that all of the patterns are legitimate. And so there's a problem we have is uncertainty of data and GPS tells is a really brilliant way of illustrating this. Even the PIR detectors, which is that thingy up there, which say, based on heat, says there's people here. And I don't know if you've been in labs where if you're all sitting very quietly and move, not moving, the lights suddenly go out. It's that one of them. And they have probably much less variability. So GPS is rather neat for teaching the importance of understanding your data from your sensors. I first came across the problem with location accuracy when I was down in a conference in um, Santiago, Chile. And we went down halfway down in the one day to one of the wineries. And I was taking some photos with my camera of the rather beautifully presented food, plate by plate. And when I got back to the hotel and connected up the internet and got the location taggings sorted out at that point and plotted onto a map, I found some 22 kilometres out of place. Which I thought, well, that's intriguing. However, does GPS get so bad? And that was when I started this work. It meant that I could move my students away, IT students, from doing survey-based stuff, which is difficult for some undergraduates, to something where they can do the thing themselves. They can take some photos of places they know of and calculate the accuracy. Now, this is a trace, 24-hour trace, taken every second or so, every five seconds, of that GPS tracker, that Canon GPS tracker, sitting either in the garden or in the conservatory for 24 hours. Now, the average position isn't too bad, but you can see how much that's 30, 40 meters error there. But what you can also see is that there, there is this consistency. It kind of does sort of work on the basis of where I was last time is a good predictor of where I will be. Next reading. Lots of error, lots of interesting stuff there that can be helpful. Interestingly, a couple of months ago, a month and a half ago, I was in China and took a whole load of photos, all of which were taken about over here somewhere, and every single photo is hundreds of metres in error. That one's not unreasonable, that was inside the, the, room, the hotel room, but these ones were in clear, well, clear sky, except there's some very high-rise buildings around, hotels and so on. And the same problem showing there as well. So location tag photos illustrate the point rather neatly. Now, why is it actually important that we ought to know what's going on? Well, we all know that a lot of businesses, retail businesses, like to send out location target adverts. And a company called Think Near did some work in 2014 through 16, analysing the assumed location and, as far as I can tell, the accurate location of billions of location target adverts. Yeah, about 32% are within 100 metres, it turns out. That's all. Fifteen percent are more than a hundred kilometres in error. 
60 miles. Now, those are ones you don't mind about. You're not very happy about one to 10 kilometer errors. 10 to 100 kilometer errors, you're really not very enthusiastic about. And certainly, if they're telling you you're here, sending you an advert for something, a Starbucks in uh, Sheffield or Manchester, and you're in Derby, you're going to be really fairly unhappy. Look, it actually could affect your reputation as a company. So it's kind of important. Another thing that's rather interesting is that we've got all these errors in terms of the horizontal latitude longitude errors, but uh, vertical error is also fairly impressive. And it's all to do with the geometry of where the satellites are in the, in the sky. If the satellites are very comparatively low on the horizon, or most of them are nearer the horizon than above, then the geometry says that they can't detect altitude changes because the time differences between there and there are going to be identical or almost identical. Whereas if the satellites are vert up, right up there, then the timing will be easily detect from there to there. But then conversely, the horizontal accuracy is going to be worse because they can't detect the sideways movements. And I've got a student, um, Ryan Davidson, who's working, finishing off this week. Um, he, st he took a tr my tracker and walked up the, s the various levels in the north, the um, stairwell between north and east towers over KR. Now, this illustrates one of the other problems. This, he switched it off there, walked up to the next flight, and switched it back on. So you can see the startup problem as it's trying to work out. But being a pure GPS as opposed to a persistent GPS, it takes quite a few seconds, uh, a minute or two or more to start up, and you can see this happening. He then did one where he started at the top, left it running the whole time for something like 45 minutes, uh, hang on. I'm not sure which way around this is, but yeah, about 30, 40 minutes. And, but you can you still see how it kind of isn't constant, it kind of moves itself up, it get down there, so that's when he's walking down the stairs, got to the, the, the next um, landing, and then it kind of worked up to where it should have been. And these lower ones didn't get there quite. So the Google altitude, he was working it from uh, the 3D Google, and it turns out when he back, his back checked, I was talking to him yesterday, he actually worked from knowing how many feet there were the steps between each level and knowing what the base level of the unit was, you could check what it was assuming as well going up the stairs. So still this curious climbing, climbing, climbing. And I was on the top of Mont Montreal in Montreal a few years ago with just taking photo, a location to take photos with my camera every 30 seconds at a point at the top of the highest point on Montreal, where I, you can tell what altitude is. And at no point in those 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, <coughs> did it ever get me above ground. I was deep underground all the time. So there's, again, all sorts of fun stuff. Now, this is the raw data that they were, that they were getting for some of the work last year. And this is from the Microsoft GeoLife data, which was collected between 2007 and 2012. 17,000 journeys with trackers and so on around mainly Beijing, but also other parts of China, taking readings about every five seconds or so. And they were wanting to use it to, to be able to plot where activities were happening so they could consolidate all of the data and then see where stuff was going on in Beijing. And they were wanting to look at aspects to do with social uh, interaction and, and things like that, parking and traffic flows. <clears throat> but I gave them access to this, I pointed them to it, but the students just took those as raw data. Now some of them would tag, in theory, if you can find it, with what's type of motor transport, buses, bicycles and so on, but most of them weren't. <clears throat> and so they just had this 
contextless sets of data. And from those, that pair with a time difference there, of that one's a one second that it happens, you can calculate distances and velocities, and then by picking up all three of them, acceleration. And we ended up with, you can end up very simply with plots like that. That was looking at the acceleration vector between each pair of points. And as you can see, we have a whole lot where we're running at less than the meter per second squared, and this lot's really nice and low. But you can see huge numbers of quite interesting excursions, and on a five second interval, it's somewhat unlikely that we're going to change velocity by 20 meters per second in five, um, in five seconds, four meters per second squared. This is not normal vehicle behavior. That's a PIR switching us off. What gets more interesting is when you see some of these very big excursions. <coughs> now, if you're thinking in terms of data in context, it's really quite obvious that there's an enormous number of erroneous readings there, because that's half a G each side. Uh, one gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, which is up there. No ordinary consumer vehicle or mode of transport does that, particularly over a, <coughs> over a five second interval. So eyeballing it, we can tell very easily there's an awful lot of error, erroneous ones. And the challenge was, okay, so we can tell all of those are most likely to be wrong, and almost all of those are most likely to be wrong. But how do you do that algorithmically? You can also do it if you plot it actually on a map. Uh, you, from my tracker, you take the NMEA uh, data, turn it into KML files, which you stuff into Google Maps, Google Earth, and you can see exactly where the journey takes you. And you can see that you're not on the road. You can see as you come down Abbey Street, you're on the right-hand side of the road and the other side of the buildings. All the way down Abbey Street until you get to the end of the traffic lights and then it kind of comes back as the houses get out, sort of, um, are further apart and so on. The question is, how can we actually do something interesting? How do we solve the veracity problem? Can we identify the readings which are correct? Can we identify how badly in error the rogue readings are? And can we actually do anything more useful with it? <coughs> now, Prokhorima is an autoregressive integrated moving average. And if you think about the journey, Every data point is very, very tightly correlated because of physics and mechanics and inertia and everything else about how a vehicle or a person moves with two or three or four data points behind it. So it is actually valid to use ARIMA for this job. Yep, it comes from the SAS econometrics time series, which is you know, big intervals, days, weeks, months, and small numbers. Whereas it turns out if you think back to the actual statistics of ARIMA rather than the SAS implementation, there's no good reason why you can't use proper, uh, ARIMA technology or algorithms on journey data because that incredibly tight connection between where I am now is closely related to where I was last second and five seconds before. And in the context of that discussion with um, a couple of attendees after the my presentation from the uh, train transport system, they were pointing out, you know, you can take a reading every five seconds on a half mile long train and the velocity will not change at all at between five seconds once they've got going. The acceleration is incredibly low, as is the deceleration. 
And so where I am now is for that, if you've got a sick, uh, big train, half a mile long, 50,000 ton train, going at 60 miles an hour, it is going to be doing 88 feet per second every second. So it doesn't matter what the GPS tells you, if it tells you anything other than 88 feet per second, you know there's something wrong with that reading. And it might actually be quite interesting to do <laughs> to actually work, take some data from uh, a train. In fact, I've actually got I've actually got a trace from Hong Kong all the way up to Beijing, which is about a three-hour flight. So that means I've probably got 20,000 data points of an aircraft, and that will be interesting to uh, unscramble because aircraft don't change velocity very fast. If you think about their momentum, their mass, then they kind of just keep going. Yes, there's the wind and the airstream they're flying in that might slow it down a bit, but you don't tend to be rocking foot back and forth or bouncing more than actually. Even the worst ripples, most is you're only really moving about that much every, every now and then. So a REMA approach, this autoregressive integrated moving average, is probably something that's quite useful. Now, Alex Taylor and Tahira Sultani last year were the ones who cottoned on to what Arima could do. And they were looking at a couple of different um, journeys. Now, we know, I mean, this is how bad the data actually ends up as. Here we have acceleration of two, two and a half G, with deceleration and uh, acceleration of over 4G. Now we know that cars don't do that. And we know that this data was not from a Formula One racetrack. So it's very, very easy using Arima to actually work out what the outliers were. And it kind of picks all of those up nice and easy. These are the big ones. It doesn't pick up because I think of an implementation limit of how many outliers it can cope with it didn't pick up some of the ones here because it's using data without context, just that it's autoaggressive, it's all internally consistently. It was able to actually take a lot of this data, and you can see here, when, it, when they ran it in the forecast mode, it actually did a lot better job than you might have expected. It actually managed to s remove most of the... the uh, of that lot there, which are clearly unfeasible. It's done a pretty good job of smoothing. It hasn't smoothed it to the, to the within a so half a metre a second or less, but it's done a pretty impressive job, I think. And the REMA, without knowing anything about the data context, has actually, in terms of its forecasting, done a very, very good job. I have to say, I was quite surprised that without the context, it still did a good job. It can tell you, and this is a nice thing, the way that SAT has implement, implemented Proker Rima, it can actually tell you the, which observations it thinks are pretty bad. So, our conclusions were that even without knowing the physics, of what it was about, or the, re the real world data uh, context, it could actually do quite a good job. Because having identified all of those, um, by, I mean, basically you can go from, here's the real data, here's the forecast data, you can identify all of the points which are problematic by post-processing in, in the data step perhaps. It can also identify very quickly the really serious major outliers. But to get to the really accurate uh, way of assessing accuracy, you probably need to build, have extra um, context built into the processing, which can't be done in the REMA. You've got to do it in your own data step or your own algorithms outside of the um, REMA. So, 
This is based on work by um, Ryan Davidson this year, Alex Taylor and Tahira Sultani last year, and Mark George uh, the year before that. So the lessons learned, well, one, we can't process this sort of data, whether any sort of sensor data, without understanding its context, the physics, the mechanics of the actual data, uh, actual environmental factor that's being measured. Now, if you're looking at temperature in here, using a thermometer, you will probably see a lot of jitter on the signal, but yet we know that this volume of air is not going to change its temperature significantly in under a time frame of minutes uh, to quarter of an hour. It will stay very, very constant. It will move its temperature slowly. It won't jitter up and down, up and down, up and down. And so we need to be thinking as we look at our data streams, our time series of our IoT devices, to think about what's really going on in the physical world that's generating those numbers. And it's also the case that you can also be thinking about if you're looking at time series of, say, financial services transactions. There is always going to be some connection to what's going on in terms of prices, volumes of sales, and so on, that you need to be thinking about this. But you're also thinking about what fraud is going on in the background? What are the abusive trading techniques that people are trying to do to manipulate the market that you can actually see? And again, it has things like inertia. The prices of shares don't normally leap around the countryside at a fantastic rate of knots in just outside of certain bands. And suddenly, you get a flash crash and you go like that. And then you know something's gone wrong. And that's how they detect it a rapid rate of change of certain stock prices over a few seconds, at which point they'll cut the switch the system off for a short while. Because they're thinking about what things like momentum, the inertia of the systems that don't allow prices to, to jump about in enormous direction, uh, changes all the time. So there's a lot of important aspects where we think, have to think about how does the real world actually work in relation to our measurements that we're taking? And how do we smooth that? How do we identify the errors? How do we identify the outliers? How do we identify the real business problems? So that's what I was talking about. That's the presentation. And uh, 